I like what Scarlett said. If you came in here in a bad mood, you can't leave without one. I mean, you... <laughs> Let me re rephrase that. If you came in in a bad mood, you cannot leave in one. If you do, something is wrong. Can I get an amen? amen. All right, this morning I am going to... Uh, I, I almost played a video this morning. I wanted to be like Pastor Bobby, but I couldn't do it. How many of y'all saw the movie with Jackie Chan, and I can't remember his name? Chris, Chris no, it wasn't Chris Rock. Rush Hour. Rush Hour. I think it's the first Rush Hour where, uh, huh? Chris Tucker, yeah. So they are, uh, they're waiting outside, and then on the radio, this song is playing War. And Jackie Chan starts singing it with his Asian accent, you know, and uh, Chris Tucker makes fun of him, and but then they sing it together, you know, and and uh, it's a real upbeat. It, it's fast song. War. What is it good for? Absolutely. And the song says absolutely nothing. So my message this morning is war. What is it good for? Absolutely everything. That song's got it wrong. Because I'm telling you, if you're a believer, you are in warfare. Uh, and you know, nobody likes war, right? There's always casualties in war, and, uh, and it can be a very traumatic experience to see the travesties that war can cause, and so nobody wants war. But there will always be war as long as there is evil. And it is absolutely wrong for anybody to refrain from war because they're afraid of the carnage or any other reason. War is an absolute necessity as long as there is evil. When there is no war in the midst of evil, you get North Korea. Now, I don't know how much you know about North Korea, but you don't want to live in North Korea. And there are many places like North Korea in the world. There are actually 52 countries in the world right now that we know of where the Bible is illegal. The very Word of God is illegal. That's because those countries are led by evil regimes. You don't want to live in a, in a world where there is no war as long as there's evil. Now, there's coming a day when there'll be no more evil and there'll be no more war. And I am looking forward to that day. We have no idea this side of heaven what that's going to look like or what that's going to feel like, but we get glimpses. And those glimpses are pretty beautiful. I'm longing for that day. But we, are, as of yet, are not in that day. So we're going to talk about war this morning. You ready? I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures to help you prepare for war. Uh, I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures to encourage you on why not to fear. God's got this. Um, so you might want to write these references down. You're not going to have enough time to write everything down except the references because I'm going to be rocking and rolling. You ready? ready? So, you know, as a pastor, one of my, I feel like one of my callings is I'm a watchman on the wall. As a pastor... I can see things in the spirit realm, and it's just a gifting that God's given me. And I can see evil approaching from all directions. Uh, and that's a kind of a blessing and a curse. The blessing is that, you know, I see it, and I, and I get to talk about it, and I get to warn people. The curse is I feel like a watchman on the wall, and I'm screaming the enemy's coming, and nobody's listening. And if you go read the Old Testament, when God was talking to the prophets, he told several of them, I have placed you as a watchman on the wall. Your job is to warn the people. If you warn the people and they do not heed your warning, their blood is on their hands. If you do not warn the people and they get captured, then their blood is on your hands. And so I cannot not talk about what I see. I cannot not talk about the evil that is approaching and warn the people of God to be ready. Now, I'm not preaching this for you to be scared. I'm preaching this for you to be prepared. There's absolutely nothing for us as believers to be afraid of. There are casualties in war, and some of us may be casualties. But you know what? For the Christian, when you die, all, the only thing that happens is you get promoted. And it's not bad. It's good. Promote me. You know what I mean? Come on. Uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's not bad to get promoted. 
I don't care how good your life is here. If you're a born again believer and you get to heaven, your life is going to be multi times better. <laughs> there's no more battle. There's no more struggles. Right here, we have struggles. We have battles, right? So I want to start <coughs> in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 18, is Paul's detailed information of the armor of God. This isn't in here so that we can sit around and do nothing. Paul puts this in here to tell us that we are indeed engaged in a war and we need to put on the, um, the armor of God so that we are prepared for what lays ahead, right? So in verse 10, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Why? So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Listen, the devil is scheming. The, the devil's looking. Every, every believer has a demonic assignment. They're watching you to see where your weaknesses are, to see where maybe you're not covered in armor, to try to take advantage of that. We want to put on the full armor of God. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, it's against the authorities, it's against the powers of this dark world, and it's against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Some people tell me I get too political. Really? Have you ever read your Bible? Who did the prophets talk to when they were here? They talked to the kings, the rulers of that day, and spoke the word of God to them. And that's exactly what we should be doing today. We're either going to be ruled by the covenants of God, or we're going to be ruled by the covenants of man. You pick which one you want. In America, we have the, the wonderful privilege of being able to pick who represents us in office. And by the way, can I just tell you, over the last hundred years, we've made some terrible choices. We have actually elected and have in office right now, all throughout the land, many people who are evil. We voted for them. And many times we voted for them because they promised us things we wanted to hear. Don't ever vote for somebody because they promise you things, especially things out of the national treasury. Somebody's got to pay for that. It's you. It's the taxpayer. They're not giving you nothing. Nothing is free. The only thing that I know of is free is salvation. And that's because Jesus paid the price. So don't tell me I'm political. I'll just tell you I'm biblical. Again, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Did you get that? Evil is everywhere. It's rooted itself in high places. Uh, I don't know why God does things the way he does, because I, I don't trust us as much as God does, evidently. Um, but he has entrusted us. Listen, the kingdom of God is going to go forth, with or without us. Jesus is in control. Truthfully, some of those songs we sang this morning, Jesus has already won the victory. Amen. Right? It's all, it's already, the work's already been done. But for whatever reason, we still contend with evil for the here and now. And God has entrusted you and I and all of us who've put our faith and trust in Jesus, he's entrusted us with that battle. He's entrusted us to get in that war. And uh, one of the things that bothers me, and I mentioned this earlier as a pastor, is 90% of, of Christians in America seem to be oblivious to the war. They're oblivious to, to what's going on. Jose gave me something this morning in the prayer room. In war, there's three types of people. There are those who are engaged in the battle. Hello? There are those who are dead. And there's those who are imprisoned. Which one are you? Are you engaged in the battle? Are you spiritually dead? Or are you a prisoner of war? God didn't call us to be dead, and he didn't call us to be a prisoner of war. He called us to be engaged in the battle. Amen? So again, he reiterates in verse 13, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground 
And after you've done everything to stand, what are we supposed to do? Stand. stand. We confront evil face to face. Too many people in the church of God in America are afraid of evil. Really? I mean, you've got a tremendous amount of lack of knowledge and lack of relationship with Jesus if you're afraid of evil. Come on. Do you get it? Jesus has already won. Satan was defeated at the cross of Calvary. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. It's already been won. Amen? So we need, to, we need to be willing to confront evil. We need to be willing to stand. And when we've done everything we know to do, we still stand. We stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around our waist. How many of y'all got the belt of truth on this morning? Listen, we need to be telling the truth. We don't need to be those that twist. You know, we live in a world where, and this started happening in the early 90s to me, where people started twisting everything to their advantage. And now they call it spin. The church should not be involved in spin. Everything is black and white. There is truth and there's lies. And if you mix lies with the truth, it's a lie. We need to be truth tellers. And don't put up with people who are mixing lies with truth. You need, to be, you need to know the Word of God well enough to be able to stand right in the middle of that and divide the Word of God and say, this is truth. And we live by truth. Amen? i got to quit looking up there. I keep losing my place. And the breastplate of righteousness in place. How many, how many of y'all are walking at the breastplate of righteousness on this morning? You're walking in righteousness. Okay, y'all wasn't near as excited about that as you was truth. You know why that is? Because most of you don't believe you're righteous. You know yourselves. You know your failures. You know your shortcomings. Listen, that don't matter. Jesus is righteous, and at the cross, he gave you his righteousness. He took your sins upon himself. You are righteous before God. How many of y'all got on the breastplate of righteousness now? And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. How many of y'all are prepared to share the gospel? If you're not, you better get that way. It's the only thing that matters is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. How many songs this morning did we sing about faith? Come on. How many of you have faith this morning? How many of you got more faith now than you did when you came in? We take up the shield of faith with which, which we can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Listen, this is the way the enemy works. He comes at you with doubt and fear. And he throws lies at you. That's what those fiery darts the Bible talks about coming at you. How do you d extinguish the fiery darts? How do you extinguish the lies and the doubts and the fear? It's through faith. What is faith? Faith is believing things hoped for, not yet seen. Come on, all the promises of God we haven't seen come true yet, but we know they will. That's what faith is. Faith is believing despite our circumstances. Listen, circumstances should not change your praise, but praise can change your circumstances. Somebody needs to raise a hallelujah in this place. In the presence of my enemies. Yes. Tomorrow, when you're at work and your enemies rise up, somebody needs to raise a hallelujah. Yes. Tomorrow, when you're surrounded by unbelief, people speaking unbelief, somebody needs to raise a hallelujah. Yes. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. What's the sword of the Spirit? It's the Word of God. It's the only offensive weapon in the armor. Now, now, personally, I believe that we have multiple weapons. God's given us his word, which is the primary. It's the sword of the spirit. But I tell you also, praise and worship is a sword. It changes things. It changes our circuit. And I'll tell you something else. Prayer is a weapon. Prayer changes things. Somebody ought to get excited about that. Somebody ought to get interested in prayer. Somebody ought to get interested in praise and worship. Somebody ought to get interested in the study of the Word of God. 
and pray, verse 18, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Listen, as believers, we are called to be alert. We need to pray for God to activate and, and, and multiply our spiritual gifts. Some of our giftings is, like one gifting is discernment. How many of y'all need more discernment? We need to have discernment. We need to know the truth of what's going on in all these circumstances that are all around us. You need to be able to hear what somebody's saying and know what they mean. Because in the world we live in, everybody spins everything to make it sound good for them. We need discernment to know what is the truth. What's the real motive? What's behind that? We need wisdom. Where does wisdom come from? The Bible says wisdom comes from God. James said, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask. God gives freely. If you're walking around ignorant this morning, it's nobody's fault but your own. You have failed to ask God for wisdom. We need understanding. Where does understanding come from? Understanding comes from knowing the Word of God and applying it and getting understanding. We need to study the Word of God. We need to apply the Word of God so that we can have wisdom and understanding and discernment to function in the world that we live in. Every one of us ought to be prophets in some form or fashion. How many of y'all would get scared to death if a prophet walked in here this morning and got the microphone? I got news for you. One's got it right now. <laughs> but that's not the kind of prophet you're scared of. The kind of prophet you're scared of is one that you're afraid is going to get up here and read your mail. That's the kind of prophet you're scared of, isn't it? Don't be afraid. Prophets aren't here to embarrass you. Prophets are here to encourage you, inspire you, and challenge you to get on with it so that you too can have those prophetic giftings. So that you can walk in. If you've got wisdom, understanding, and discernment, you're going to have some prophetic giftings. Hello? They're for everybody. They're not just for prophets. James chapter 4, James said, Therefore, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Listen, we've got some things we've got to do. We have to be proactive. We can't just be sitting and submissive and receiving. We've got to be proactive. The Bible says, flee the devil. Huh? Resist the devil. I'm sorry. Resist the devil. And he must flee. One of the reasons Satan has so much ruling and reigning and authority in America today is believers are too apathetic. They're not resisting the devil. They're not putting him on the run. It's time that we took our place. The God-given... Listen, does the Spirit of the living God live in you? The Bible says the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead... We'll talk about that next week. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. What are you afraid of? What in the world are you waiting on? Let's start putting, let's start putting demons to flight. <coughs> come near to God, and He will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Listen, if you're sitting out there, and you're not reading your Bible, and you're not praying... And you're not doing the things you know. You're double-minded. What do you come to church for? You come to church to be encouraged, inspired, and challenged. You can't just sit there and take it and go home and be the same. If you do, something is seriously wrong in your life. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up. We don't have near enough humility going on in the church of the living God. We got too much cocky and arrogance. People think they know everything. Hello? First John chapter 4. John said, You dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Amen. How many of y'all believe that? I'm telling you right now, most of y'all don't believe that. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. You might want to write that down because you need to leave here knowing that in your, in your knower. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. What are we afraid of? We need to, listen, 
It's not just preachers. Every believer needs to be able to stand up and speak to the darkness. One of the songs we sang this morning, I will watch the darkness flee. Why? Because I'm going to raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies, in the presence of unbelief. And I will watch the darkness flee. They, the, uh, the, they are from the world, and therefore they speak from the viewpoint of the world. Listen, get this. Everybody that's not, that's not a believer speaks from a worldly viewpoint. See, I have a biblical worldview. If you're a, if you're a believer, you should have a biblical worldview, not a secular worldview. Most of the people we deal with out in the public realm have a secular worldview. So they think from a secular viewpoint. Now, the really sad thing is probably more than half of Christians in America, and I'm talking about those that go to church, have a secular worldview. Because, see, again, if you don't know the Bible, if you're not reading your Bible, you're not applying your Bible, you're not praying, you're not worshiping, then you probably don't have a biblical worldview. You have a secular worldview. You're more influenced by the culture than you are by the Word of God. That would cause you to have a secular worldview. We should be the ones who have a biblical worldview. We look through the biblical viewpoint. We look through the eyes of Jesus, which is different than the world. Jesus came to make war against the world. Hello? Some of y'all don't believe that. I'll get to that in a minute. And the world listens to them. But we are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary... They have divine power to demolish strongholds. Listen, our weapons are greater than any weapons in anybody in the world has ever seen. I mean, the world's got guns and, and bombs and stuff they can shoot with, but they can't bring down strongholds. The power of the Word of God, the power of prayer, the power of worship brings down strongholds. God has given us incredible weapons, and we're just sitting on them. We need to quit sitting on them and start activating them. You need to start speaking to the demons in your life. You need to start speaking to the demonic strongholds over your family. You need to start speaking over the demonic strongholds over your work, over your cities, over your communities. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now listen, that's easy to overread, but I'm telling you that takes some work. It's going to take some effort on your part to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Because you've got a real enemy. The real enemy is planting thoughts in your mind. He's trying to make you think about things you shouldn't think about. He's trying to, and if he can get you to think about things you shouldn't think about, he can get you to do things you shouldn't do. But if you are really taking to captive every thought and making obedience to Christ, he has no hold in your life. Amen. Come on, because that's all he's got. All Satan's got is deception and trickery. And if, you don't, if you're strong enough not to fall for it, you're full of the Word of God, full of the Spirit of God, he has no hold on you. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be self-controlled, here's that word again, and alert. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You know what that tells me? He can't devour everybody. There's only certain people he can devour. Who are they? It is the exact same principle that works in the wild. Lions don't attack the biggest animal. They work in groups, right? But what are they doing? They're looking for the weakest link, right? So they'll run at them and get them to running, and then they'll pick out the weakest one, which is usually a calf or a, a young adult that hadn't fully developed, and they'll separate it from the herd and chase it down and kill it and eat it. That's exactly the way demons work. They look for the weakest link. 
They run at you. They jump at you. They lunge at you. Uh, last week, we, we, somehow I keep talking about my puppy and my messages. How does that happen? <laughs> it's like my new baby, you know. But we got a new puppy, and so we had to leave it with, a, with somebody for about 30 hours last week. And, uh, and, they had a, and, and my puppy's about 15 pounds. It's a German Shepherd. It's just a puppy. And uh, he had a 90-pound Rockwaller. And he said it was so funny because the German Shepherd puppy would want to play and would bark and jump at that uh, 90-pound Rockwaller, and the Rockwaller would jump back like, what just happened? What is this? And that's exactly the way it is with the devil. He jumps at you. He ain't got no power. He ain't got no authority unless you give it to him. But he jumps at you to see how you react. If you jump back, he keeps going forward. But if you stand, if you hold your ground, hello. I was asking the the dog trainer about, I said, what would you do if you were walking down the street and a 150-pound dog attacked you? What would you do? And he said, well, first of all, most dogs won't really attack. If you'll turn around and face them and hold your ground, hello, they won't attack. They're just bluffing. Now, he said, if a 150-pound dog actually does attack you in that situation and you have stood, then that dog needs to die. But he told me how he would handle it. He would grab the dog by the face of it, try to grab it by the face, the loose skin around its head, hold its head, and try to flip it over. Because if you flip it over, it has no power. All of, his, all of his strength is in his upper body and his legs. You get him flipped over on his back, he can't do nothing. You can hold him there till the police come or whatever. You know what I mean? Uh, you wouldn't have to be the one to actually kill him. But isn't that the way the devil is? See, he, he's, he's, he's just bluffing. He's jumping at you. He's leaping at you to see what you do. If you jump back, why would you jump back? You jump back because you're afraid. Why would a believer in Christ filled with the Holy Ghost, full of the Spirit of the living God, why would he jump back? Now listen. If you jump back, I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm trying to encourage and inspire you to hold your ground and stand your ground. The devil is a bluff. He has no power, no authority, no control whatsoever unless you give it to him. Quit giving it to him. Come on. You don't get no simple than that. Somebody write that down. Quit giving it to him. Resist him. Here it is again. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith, hello, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And this is true today. You know, we live in a free culture right now, free society. Praise the Lord. We we have taken it for granted for 240-something years. But we ain't always took it for granted. There were times when we as a nation were willing to fight for that. Today we're fighting ourselves. Half the country wants socialism. Half the country understands what it means to be free and what it costs to be free and is willing to pay that price again. How much more as believers should we be willing to pay that price to remain free? Everything that Jesus come for was to make us free. It's not something that, that we use to do whatever we want. That freedom is what gives us the liberty to obey the Word of God. And we'll never be happy until we actually obey the Word of God. Come on. Isaiah 54, 17 says this, No weapon formed against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. Now everybody repeat that after me. No weapon formed against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. Well, that's as far as I want you to go. Calm down. You stop when I stop. Listen, we need to know that there's no weapon formed against us that will prevail. And we also need to know that God is telling us to stand up and refute every tongue that accuses us. Now, you're going to see that every once in a while in the public realm. Somebody's going to accuse you of something, and you need to be willing to defend your ground. You need to be willing to know the Word of God. But where it really happens the most is when the enemy whispers those thoughts in your head, that's when you need to be able to confront that tongue. That More than any other place, that's where you've got to be able to confront that tongue. And you confront it with the Word of God. You confront it with the promises of God. 
The enemy's always going to mix just enough truth in it to make it believable. That's where you got to have discernment. Listen, I know what I did, but evidently you don't know what Jesus did. Let me remind you. This is what Jesus did for me, and I'm free. I'm a blood-bought saint of God. There are no accusations stand against me. Come on. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. What does verse 37 say? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Listen, if you're a believer, you're a conqueror. Quit backing up. You're not retreating, you're gaining ground. You are the conqueror. Not because of us, but because of Jesus. And Jesus is in us. We are more than conquerors. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57 says this. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Man, how many times have you heard that this morning? Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Does does anybody need a definition of nothing? Let nothing move you. If anything's moving you, you need to stop it. Because the Bible says, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now listen, sometimes your labor in the Lord will appear to be vain. Am I right? Have any of y'all ever preached to a group of people before? Sometimes your labor feels like it's in vain. (laughs) Nobody's listening. Nobody's doing. But it is not. It does not matter what we see. We do not see everything. I have left here and preached my heart out, left it all out on the table and felt like nobody got a thing. To only find out later, somebody did. And and let me ask you a question. Is it worth it if only one happens? Jim and Helen got on the radio yesterday for the first time and they were talking about this morning. You know, even even if it only saved one soul, it'd be worth it. And Charles Spurgeon said something very similar. You know, if, if, if I preach for 40 years and only one soul gets saved, it's worth it. Because how, what is the value of one soul? It is infinitely much. The value of one soul. Now, we'd like to see more than one, but if it's only one, it's still worth it. So don't let yourself be discouraged. Uh, our labor in the Lord is never in vain. Things are happening whether you can see it or not. You're having an effect with your words whether you can see it or not. How many of y'all have ever had a discussion with somebody and you get into a biblical argument and you leave feeling like you didn't accomplish a thing. I promise you, you did. Because we all do the same thing when we have a conversation with somebody. We all do the same thing. When we leave, we rehash the conversation. Right? Now, sometimes our pride and ego will get in the way in the conversation, and we won't receive anything. Right? Because I'm, I'm a man. I already know. Or, or whatever. You know, we, we get, either ego or pride jumps in there and keeps us from receiving in the, in the middle of the conversation. But when you leave the conversation, despite your pride and ego, you're going to rehash the conversation. Well, guess what? They're doing that to your conversation too. They're going to rehash your conversation. They're gonna, and if you have spoken the Word of God, they are going to rehash the Word of God. You and I are not responsible for the results. You and I are responsible to be faithful. God is responsible for the results. If we could get that through our head, it would change the way we witness. Because most of y'all are probably like me. When you're talking to somebody, you want them to fall down on their knees and start crying and accept Christ right there at the moment. <clears throat> that very seldom happens. It's usually a process. It, in fact, it may take more than one of you to talk to them. You may have to share what you can. Somebody else. Can. That's why Paul said some of us water, some of us plant, and, and some of us get to see the increase. See, you may be a planter. You may be a waterer. Somebody else may be the one. A lot of times evangelist is the one that comes by and gets to reap the harvest, right? But it doesn't matter. we got a part to play. Our, if our part's plant, let us plant like Johnny Appleseed. If our job is to water, let us water like we own a lake. And we want to empty that lake out on people. Amen? 
Zechariah chapter 4 says this. The Lord said, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Listen, the battle that we fight is not in the flesh. The battle we fight is in the, in the spirit. It's the Lord. It's by his might and by his power. Amen? Amen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 says this, verse 2. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing <coughs> and will continue to do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. Okay, look, I want you to see Paul, the apostle, and, and from our viewpoint, probably the greatest apostle of all of them. He's asking the people of God to pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. Listen, if there were wicked and evil men in Paul's days, there's wicked and evil men today. We need to be praying that God delivers us all from wicked men. Not everyone has faith. Don't think because you're a Christian everyone else is. Don't even think because people say they're a Christian they're a Christian. We've already established through the, through the years here that 65% of Americans have deceived themselves into thinking there's something they're not. They confess Christianity, but there's no fruit in their life. They're not saved. They're not born again. If the, if the Spirit of the living God lives inside of you, you will produce fruit. Amen. And then in verse 3 he says, Listen, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Another reason for us not to fear. God will protect us. Wherever he leads us, it's by his design. It's by his plan. We have nothing to fear. And then in verse 5, I want you to notice he said, May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. You've heard me say this a thousand times. One thing we need as Christians, uh, uh, probably above everything else, is perseverance. Christians, we are weak and we are fable. When we face distress, when we face trouble, our first tendency is to turn tail and run. We can't do that. We've got to persevere. When you run into a wall and it bounces you back, are you going to quit and turn around or are you going to keep banging that wall until you break through? Every wall can be broken through, but it takes perseverance. Sometimes in the spirit realm, we're going to run into walls. We've got to be willing to persevere and keep going until we get through that wall. The stronghold that is behind that block can be at different levels, right? If it's a, it's a serious evil stronghold, it's going to take a lot of perseverance for us to break through. Amen. How many of you want to break through? Amen. The Bible says we are more than conquerors. Come on, we're not afraid of a wall. Luke chapter 10, Jesus said, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Yes. Now, how many of y'all, if I told you to go trample on snakes and scorpions, would do it? One person. Listen, Jesus said we could do it. Jesus give us authority over snakes and scorpions. And more than that, what does he say? And to overcome all the power of the enemy. There's nothing for us to be afraid of. Somebody needs to gird up your loins and get ready. Huh? Deuteronomy chapter 28. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction but flee from you in seven. Now, this is in the Old Testament. God is speaking this to the Israelites. But what if you go back and you read that passage, what God did is phenomenal. And the lessons God taught were phenomenal. Think about this just a minute. When God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, Egypt had the greatest army on the planet. Did you know not one Israelite lost his life in that departure? The whole Israeli army, I mean, the whole uh, Egyptian army was destroyed, and not one Israelite was harmed. As God brought them out of slavery into freedom. I'm kind of thinking God knows what he's doing. I'm kind of thinking God is able. Against all odds, 
God is able. That not one hair on your head will be harmed, but he'll destroy the greatest army on the planet. What are we worried about? What are we afraid of? See, we either really don't know who God is, or we really put too much confidence in our flesh. But we're not supposed to walk in the flesh. We're supposed to walk in the spirit. We're supposed to walk in the power that God has given us. John 16, says this, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Our leader has overcome the world. Amen. There's nothing for us to fear. Romans chapter 12 says this, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Revelation 12, 11 says this, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. What are we afraid of? Listen, throughout, throughout all of the New Testament, the saints have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And there's nothing to be afraid of. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. Y'all didn't hear that. We're not afraid. We're not even afraid of death. We should not be afraid even of death. Death is a promotion. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, which when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Write that down. Fight the good fight of faith. Don't be afraid. Fight the good fight. That's what Paul told Timothy. 1 John 3, 8 says this. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Why did Jesus come? He come to destroy the devil's work. Once we're born again, we're on Jesus' side. We need to be busy destroying the works of the devil. With the power we've been given. The gifts we've been given. Joshua 23.10 says, One of you routes a thousand because the Lord your God fights for you just as he promised. One of you flights a thousand. I believe that is really true of the spiritual realm. You give me somebody who will get down on their knees and pray with power and authority from a holy God, they can send a thousand demons to flight. Man, what if we were all that way? How many demons could we flee this morning? Deuteronomy 3.22 says, Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God himself will fight for you. Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. These are not suggestions. These are commandments. Amen. Psalms 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Is that you this morning? I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by the day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. By the way, that pestilence is the stuff Jose was saying is on our money. We will not fear the pestilence that is on our money that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Now I guess I need to read that again. Y'all didn't get that. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. 
They will lift up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Some of y'all don't like snakes. You ready for this? You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him, I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15, he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Listen, I don't care how big the army is coming against you. We are not to fear. I wish that American Christians had the same spirit that a, that a Maasai warrior has. You remember when Don Babin was here and he said, if a Maasai warrior got caught out on his own and a thousand warriors from another tribe was coming at him, he would stand and face them because he would rather die than be called a coward. Pray to God that we would rather die than be called a coward of the faith. Pray to God that we would stand even if a thousand man army came against us and we were all alone. When we belong to Christ, the enemy never has the final word over our lives. We are secure in God's hands. Press on, courageous and free, never held back by fear or defeat. The battle belongs to the Lord. And he has the final victory. Let me close with this. To build authentic relationships with Jesus Christ, we have to declare war against whatever worldly entanglements keep us from daily fellowship with him. We have to buck the agendas and the values of society and slow down long enough to commune with him. That's in Bill Hobble's book, Honest to God. Our prayers against the enemy's tactics along with our obedience to Christ, can create opportunities for more people to hear and understand the truth of the gospel. One of the reasons I think we're seeing so few salvations in today's world is because we're not willing to stand. We're not willing to confront sin. We're not willing to tell the truth. We have more of the attitude of, well, you know, it's their life. Whatever they want to do is up to them. It's their decision. Listen, you've got the words of life. And if you don't share them, their blood is on your hands. One of the watchwords of the American Revolution was no king but Jesus. Most of the patriots found in their faith and in God's word the courage to risk their lives and properties in order to break the tyranny of an unjust human authority. According to their Christian worldview, obedience to God took precedence over loyalty to country or government. Their primary allegiance was to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. May seeking you, O God, be my top priority and the top priority of this nation. Following Christ's teachings means everything to me. Where I have failed, forgive me. When I falter, give me a nudge. If I grow weary,